Well, the room we're in now used to be a garage. It gradually filled up with books, so now we call it a stack room. And uh, the problem of retrieval comes up every so often. Partly because a lot of people use the books and we put them down sometimes where we've used them, so. Students joke about what they find here. An autographed copy of Canterbury Tales or presentation copy of Ten Commandments. <laughs> and it has in it books of every day, but also some books that are dear to me because they've been used by my teachers. They're by former students and by colleagues and friends. So there's little bits of yourself that are scattered around the library. Richard Baxey was sort of a legend at Hopkins even when I was there in the early 60s. Well, I think he probably could have been a movie star in his day. <laughs> he had a, you know, incredible, uh, you know, presence about him. In the first year that I had, he used to ride a Harley Davidson to class. And I remember one class, he was late. And we were in the basement of Gilman and we saw him pull up jump off the motorcycle practically, run into class, rip off his aviator glasses, put him down and say, sorry, you're paying for this, you know, to apologize for being late. He was just an absolutely uh, brilliant, dashing young professor with a beautiful wife, Catherine, and the whole package. I asked a friend of mine, who is that? He said, don't you know Professor Max? <laughs> The wide-ranging knowledge awed me at, at, at first. I told my father I'd had class with a brilliant professor, Richard Maxey. And he said, Richard Maxey? And he couldn't believe it because when he was at Hopkins, you know, a few decades earlier, he had taken Richard Maxey. And he was incredibly influential for my father. At times, we were just sitting there listening to this fellow making a few notes in the hopes that we would understand, you know, four days later what he had actually been talking about because it was so brilliant. The range of subjects and the number of languages that he spoke in a class. I don't know how anybody knows six languages. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I have, I have a trouble with English. <laughs> he would hand out sheets of his own translations for certain of the things that we were reading, which is typical of, of Dick, to, to want, want to give his students the best and to be able to do that. Dick really is the jewel in the Hopkins crown. You know the famous Milton Eisenhower quote, which is, asking Dick Maxey a question is like going to a fire hydrant for a glass of water, which is a funny quote, but it doesn't include the generosity of the person. As a humanities major, he was my advisor. And his door is quite literally always open. He would host seminars in his house until, you know, 11, 12 at night. And you would be influenced by his incredible library and his whole lifestyle which became part of his teaching. And it was a kind of exhilarating uh, atmosphere. And you were simply engulfed in books. You felt like the spirit of the books was there with you. I was invited to his house sometime by the end of freshman year, and my jaw dropped open, and I go back to that same house over 30 years later, and my jaw still drops. It just, it is a book lover's haven. It's just one of the happiest places in the world. He has books to the ceiling. I mean, his entire house is a library. He has a collection of rare books and first editions that is of great value, and he's been so incredibly generous as to donate that collection to the university. The house, of course, is just rife with, with treasures. The Proust copy of Swan's Way, the first editions of Faulkner and Henry James and Edith Wharton. The books in the house are just kind of a reflection of Dick's mind. He is a truly a Renaissance man and his house is, reflects that. See, what was special about him as a teacher of writing, as a teaching of literature, is that he taught it through the eyes of the writer. And we talked a lot about the act of 
writing as an attempt to capture the human experience, to understand your own narrative, to um, understand the larger themes and the bigger picture. Just the idea of not limiting yourself to any particular one way of thinking. I mean, he started the Humanities Center at Hopkins, which sort of covered all the branches of the arts and everything. And, you know, he did play a part in the movie we shot at Hopkins. He was the person who brought the first class here in film studies, African-American studies, women's studies as well. And he taught over in the medical school. I think what he did was open up everybody's eyes to the idea that life is really interdisciplinary. I don't think Dick believed that there should be boundaries in knowledge. That his life has been moving beyond seeing connection. There's no topic in the world that bores Dick. And he can regale you with stories that no one else can till three in the morning. And I think he just lived in about three hours sleep and pipe smoke for decades. He was indefatigable. I mean, the conversations went on for hours and hours. And when you were done, you were not exhausted at all. You were just invigorated and, you know, your mind was going. And it's probably how he's lived his life with so many thoughts going around in his mind that, you know, he, he can't sleep. I think he feels that, that sleep would be a waste of time when there's so much to do and so many people to educate in the best possible sense of that. I learned lessons from Dick as a teacher and as a person. I think as a teacher, it's the sheer fun of learning. And as a person, I think watching Dick, who truly outshines everybody in terms of just the power of the intellect, be so kind is a wonderful example. His manner is to be optimistic, enthusiastic, and to act with uh, a certain humility. He's one of those active minds that, that's constantly learning, and he makes you feel like he's learning from you as well. That he was always interested in us. Not only what our ideas were, but interested in us as people. And you had a sense that you were with somebody who actually cared. That's unusual uh, with a, somebody of his brilliance and, and uh, stature. And uh, one of the reasons, um, I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm emotional about this, but I am, I guess. Dick will have created a legacy at Hopkins that combines not only his philanthropy, but more importantly, his inclusiveness. And in terms of his, his relationship with students, I think that legacy continues. I hope you think about that down the Meeting Professor Maxey definitely uh, helped me make my decision as to applying early decision. Professor Maxey was so impressive and so down to earth, and I came away feeling that I would be very happy at Johns Hopkins. He is truly the epitome of what a Hopkins professor is, and I think we, we all think of him as the great guru. Dick has been here for over 50 years, so that means for 55 to 60 percent of the life of Homewood, Dick Maxey has been at the epicenter of the humanities of this school. For me, uh, Richard Maxey is an institution. I don't think there will ever be another person like Richard Maxey. He's absolutely one of a kind as a teacher, as a person. I mean, I think everybody, if they're lucky in their lives, they have two or three great teachers, and he's one of those in the lives of anybody who comes in contact with them.